Hey everybody, Jason here with Texas Storm Chasers. Today I want to talk to you guys about radar and how it works. Radars were first developed during World War II, but since then we've seen the optimization of radar for weather detection. There are hundreds of weather radars located across the United States which are capable of detecting storms and other types of weather phenomena across the country. We also have numerous mobile radar trucks that can get really close to storms and follow them along their path or inside of hurricanes and this helps get us better radar data than our standard radar sites can. Radars emit electromagnetic pulses throughout the atmosphere at multiple different angles, horizontally and vertically. As the radar beam travels throughout the atmosphere, it may interact with areas of precipitation. When radar beams interact with areas of precipitation, there's some backscattered power that returns to the radar, so the radar must listen for this backscatter radiation. The reception of some of the radar beam back to the radar is known as an echo, and the amount of power that is returned to the radar kind of determines the shape and size of the average raindrop detected. And the distance between the area of precipitation and the radar site is determined by the amount of time it takes to receive the reflectivity echo. On reflectivity displays, typically the red, purple, and white colors are used for the larger raindrops and hailstones detected by radar. Radars are also capable of detecting birds, bugs, dust, smoke, and tornadic debris, as well as these areas of precipitation. Radars can also detect wind velocity with the returns of these reflectivity echoes. Thanks to the Doppler effect, we know that raindrops being blown towards the radar will bring back a higher frequency EM wave, and raindrops being blown away from the radar while being sampled will bring back a lower frequency EM wave. It becomes of great concern when radars detect gate-to-gate -gate wind shear, which is wind moving toward the radar and away from the radar in very close proximity to each other. Signatures where we see inbound and outbound wind really close to each other are called couplets, and we have downburst couplets and tornadic couplets. We also have products like correlation coefficient, which are very handy in detecting whether or not what the radar is detecting is more like raindrops or hail or something else. If there's debris being lofted in the air by a tornado detected by radar, then correlation coefficient will be significantly lower than one. Let's also go over a couple key signatures on reflectivity echoes that help us identify what is going on in the atmosphere. The first echo we will talk about is a hook echo, which indicates the possibility of a supercellular thunderstorm with intense damaging impacts. A well-defined hook echo is likely indicating there's a strong mesocyclone taking place, which is also slinging around precipitation around its back west and south side. These strong mesocyclones can oftentimes become heavily rain-wrapped, where the hook completely closes up around itself, leaving possibly just a small bounded weak echo region, or BWR, in the reflectivity echo. If you see a bounded weak echo region on radar, that will indicate a heavily rain wrapped mesocyclone and possible tornado, which will be extremely difficult to find visually. Another key feature that we can find on reflectivity displays are fine lines, which indicate gust fronts and boundaries. Cold fronts, dry lines, outflow boundaries, and storm gust fronts can all be indicated by fine lines on reflectivity display. These fine lines can indicate oftentimes a sudden change in wind velocity. A final key feature to point out on reflectivity display is the three body scatter spike, or called a hail spike, which indicates a large, extremely dense area of hail falling in a certain area. Sometimes large hail tumbling down to the ground can disrupt the radar beam in such a fashion 
that the radar beam gets set back to the ground before it hits the radar. Hence why this is called a three-body scatter spike, because the radar beam gets sent to the ground before it returns to the radar, which also makes part of the storm appear farther away from the radar than it actually is. I hope that this crash course has taught you all a little something about radars, and I hope that it helps you interpret our future live coverage better. Keep in mind that parts of North and Central Texas are under a slight risk for severe weather this Tuesday, March 29th, for the threat at some large hail, damaging winds, and a low risk of a tornado.